Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. My name is Blair or the Illuminati and today we're going to be talking about another charity right in time for the holiday season. I know, I know. Rather than this one being about children like the Kids Wish Network, however, this one's going to be geared towards veterans and we're gonna be talking about the Wounded Warrior Project. Before we get into it, I'm going to put a quick disclaimer out there that no, I am not against supporting veterans. The Wounded Warrior Project has been a massive charity for veterans for many years, but it's the way that they operate is what I have a problem with. So just figured I had to put that out there. But anyway, let's begin by taking a look at their history and seeing how something seemingly good became so, so bad. Let's get into it. Wounded Warrior Project was founded in 2003 in Roanoke, Virginia by John Melia. John was severely injured in a helicopter crash in Somalia in 1992 while serving. Another source does say that WWP was founded in 2002, but the website itself states they were founded in 2003, so that's where I'm going. The point is, they haven't been around all that long. They also say on question 17 of their FAQ that, Wounded Warrior Project is a nonpartisan operation and we don't take a stance on the war. We believe that regardless of your politics or beliefs, the men and women in our nation's military have made tremendous personal sacrifices on our behalf and deserve our respect and any assistance we can provide. It's about the warrior, not the war. And I can agree with that, honestly. They're only one charity and they started out as a small grassroots effort. So they aren't trying to help all veterans, simply the newly injured who may be in desperate need of services. And as per usual, when we talk about nonprofits, there is some good that they do. They are a charity, they are a nonprofit after all. They have done good things for good people and I should and will absolutely acknowledge those good things. And I'm not going to criticize WWP for not helping every single veteran, just like I won't criticize Make-A-Wish for not being able to grant wishes to every single kid or not granting wishes to adults. If a charity has one set focus, that is absolutely fine. I do just wanna make that clear. Anyway, in 2005, the United Spinal Association of New York granted $2.7 million to the Wounded Warrior Project to become a standalone charity with its own identity and program since originally it operated as a division of the association. And for a while, there doesn't seem to be much else to say about them, no controversies anyway. They do have some stories on their website and obviously the people they've helped. One veteran named Manny said the combat stress recovery program from Wounded Warrior Project made a positive impact in his life immediately and he was able to cope, manage, and deal with issues like PTSD. After all, on their FAQ in question six, they make a point to say they can't help all veterans, only those who are newly injured. And by that, they seem to imply it means more of a physical injury. I thought that's what they said by doing this and they didn't wanna spread themselves too thin and maybe I'm reaching and I don't wanna assume the worst here. If they've expanded to helping those with PTSD more often, that's awesome. And again, I'm not seeing much conflict happen in their early years. So this is just kind of a side thing. In fact, it wasn't until over 10 years later that the first controversy actually arose when Wounded Warrior Project filed a lawsuit against a disabled veteran. Dean Graham went after WWP on his website and unfortunately for him at the time, he didn't have any evidence or at least it doesn't appear like he was able to back the claims that he made on his website. I don't go after bad businesses or MLMs unless I have a serious reason to. And even when a company isn't as terrible as I first thought, I do try to make that clear. So I can't entirely condone what Dean did here, even if his gut instinct did turn out to be correct. And we'll get to that in just a moment. But for right now, we need to get back into the lawsuit. It read, a national veterans assistance group is suing an Indiana veteran who says defamed it, court documents show. Graham lit into the Wounded Warriors organization on an internet website for his own nonprofit, Help Indiana Vets Incorporated, the newspaper said. WWP is a fraud that needs to be investigated immediately, the lawsuit alleges Graham wrote in an undated post on his website. The suit also claims Graham said the organization has an army of lawyers on staff to punish all those who try to expose it. Wounded Warriors denies Graham's claims that the group is not using its funding to help veterans and says his accusations have scared off potential donors, the star said. 
The Wounded Warrior Project, which says the claims have driven some donors away, had not replied to requests for comment, the star said. After the lawsuit was filed, Graham posted a notice on his website asking for donations to a legal fund for what he called the fight of a century, the newspaper said. Dean was made to apologize to the WWP on his website and retract all of his statements. NPQ nonprofit Quarterly estimates that the organization may have lost about $75,000 in donations at that time, which compared to their 150 million annual revenue in 2013, really doesn't seem like it would hurt them that much. I am not saying that Wounded Warrior Project did not have a right to sue if these statements were truly defamatory, but Graham pointed out in one of his complaints, The organization is full of former veterans administration employees and former military personnel. They are pulling the biggest okie dokie ever pulled on the American public. I don't think I've ever heard of fraud called an okie dokie, but you get the point. I have a whole host of issues with the VA and that's another issue and another video in of itself. But this lawsuit did rub me the wrong way when I started to look into it. And apparently I'm not the only one who thought that way too. The NPQ wrote, an attorney consulted by Fox 59, a local Indiana station found the nature of the lawsuit odd. Usually unfair competition claims are brought against businesses because it's only businesses that compete with each other. Graham is not the only one to have voiced concerns about the WWP. In June, as part of a year long investigation into charities across the nation, the Tampa Bay Times and the Center for Investigative Reporting investigated a number of nonprofits and found that WWP only spent 58% of the money it received on veteran programming. Additionally, the investigation found that WWP had gotten mixed reviews from independent charity watchdogs. The charity meets all 20 standards set by the Better Business Bureau's Wise Giving Alliance, but only gets three of four stars from Charity Navigator. Charity Watch gave Wounded Warrior a C plus grade up from a D two years ago, based on the amount spent on program and fundraising. Both Graham and the investigation cited the large executive salaries at Wounded Warrior Project with the investigation highlighting Wounded Warrior Project CEO salary at $330,000 and the 10 employees making over $150,000. Wounded Warrior Project rebutted by stating, we hire the best of the best and we pay them a living wage. At the time of the publication, Graham was still preparing his legal response, but said that WWP's actions served to back up the truth of his claims. So while Graham did have some evidence, it was just not enough. Not the final nail in the coffin, if you know what I mean. Even though it does bother me when CEOs of nonprofits have massive salaries and their financial statements may seem suspicious, Graham just didn't have enough ammo at the time to make the statements he was making. Some websites say that to pay the legal battle, Graham had to shut down his own charity, while others cite concern for the effects the lawsuit had on his family. The point is Wounded Warrior Project won this one. But Graham will get vindication, just you wait. But after his legal battle, it seems Wounded Warrior Project got a swelled head or something because they went after yet another charity the exact same year. A small charity known as the Keystone Wounded Warriors was the issue here. Mike Mather from WTKR reported, the founder of a small Pennsylvania charity helping wounded warriors in that state says the group has spent more than $72,000 defending a lawsuit from WWP. We're out of pocket a lot of money and I'm sure they are out of pocket a lot of money, said Paul Spurgeon, the director of Keystone Wounded Warriors and a Marine who served two combat tours in Vietnam. The issue is the similarity of the charity's logos. The famous Wounded Warrior Project logo shows a silhouette of one soldier carrying another on his back. The Keystone Wounded Warriors logo is also a silhouette of soldiers, but shows one dragging another across the ground. In a federal lawsuit, the Wounded Warrior Project declared it has suffered irreparable damage due to its business, goodwill, reputation, and profits because of the Pennsylvania Charities logo. The Wounded Warrior Project said the Pennsylvania charity's trademark would likely confuse donors. In the most recent tax records available, the Wounded Warrior Project listed an income of $234 million. The Keystone Wounded Warrior's income was $211,000, which is less than the salary of the Wounded Warrior Project CEO, Steve Nardizzi. Spurgeon said his charity once partnered with the Wounded Warrior Project and raised money for it, Later, he and others decided to start a charity for Pennsylvania veterans. 
He said a high school student designed the logo and the Keystone Wounded Warriors were granted a trademark. He said what is the most unfortunate is that both charities have spent money in court that could have been better used helping veterans. If we fight, the warrior suffers, he said, and our philosophy is it's not about us, it's about the people we serve, it's about them. The CEO of WWP, however, had stated that their trademark is so important that it has, in this case, meant suing other charities with similar logos. And again, it just really rubs me the wrong way. If these were the only two issues I had with Wounded Warrior Project, both cases of them being a little lawsuit happy, then maybe I wouldn't be making a video. But all these two instances did was set the stage for a charity that thinks pretty damn highly of itself when they were far from innocent. In the case of Graham's charity, as well as this one, they're far smaller. Yes, the logo is similar. And even though I can tell the difference, I'm pretty sure someone that isn't all familiar with those charities might be confused. But they also threatened another charity called Hope for the Warriors for five years. Hope for the Warriors says they changed the logo to modernize it anyway, as opposed to caving into demands, but Wounded Warrior Project established a pattern of pretty nasty behavior. By 2015, NPQ posed the question if Wounded Warrior Project was a neighborhood bully to other veteran charities. And I mean, it kind of feels that way, doesn't it? They also bring up the strange branding being shoved down people's throats and how it leaves a bad taste in their mouth. The headline of the article directly above the WWP logo on cans of tomato soup. The article reads, over the years, NPQ has covered any number of brand wars among nonprofits and between for-profits and nonprofits, but this one reminds us of the behavior of Susan G. Komen for the cure, the attempt of a large, well-moneyed group to squash smaller nonprofits in the name of their mission, brand, ugly. According to a number of smaller groups, the Wounded Warrior Project with annual revenues of $235 million has been spending a good deal of time and money suing other veteran serving nonprofits on the basis that their names or logos constitute infringement on their brand. So do you guys remember a little bit ago, I actually did a video about Susan G. Komen and how they're just an absolute train wreck and they went after another nonprofit called Kites for a Cure because they used For a Cure. Companies and charities absolutely reserve the right to defend themselves or sue someone if they're clearly being stolen from. But even the term wounded warrior, as the article points out, is a generic phrase used in the military community for an injured service member. But apparently Wounded Warrior Project wants to own the name now, and it appears willing to spend its donors and beneficiaries money to ensure that it is so. According to the official US Air Force website, in AFW2, a wounded warrior is defined as someone who is very serious or seriously wounded, ill, or injured. They have complex medical issues that keep them from performing one or more tasks in the military, many facing medical retirement following years of treatment. They are not all combat wounded or injured. Many have developed life-changing illnesses or have been injured in off-duty accidents. From the young lady who crashed her motorcycle into a tree and lost her leg to the young man who jumped into a lake, fracturing his neck and damaging his spinal cord, the issues that bring airmen into this program are varied. So the question is, is would Wounded Warrior Project go after the Air Force for saying the words Wounded Warrior or for having a program for them? You can kind of see how this starts to become a nasty gray area. It's just about knowing where that line is and being able to draw it. Using the words wounded warrior or some unique term they thought up of, like if that was the case and every other charity was copying them, then sure, I could see them being verifiably upset. But otherwise, as seems to be the actual case here, it's ridiculous that they'll sue other charities that make less than their CEO's salary for having another generic military term in their name. As NPQ puts it, it's the big guy beating up the little guy. We won't make the same as we did last year. What's it really about? If they keep blowing up in fundraising 50% every year and we're going to go backwards this year, what is the point? Spurgeon, the Keystone Wounded Warriors executive director said, the money that we get in donations to help warriors, is that going to make or break them? They're whining about a small number of legitimate nonprofits. I'm at a loss. We should all be working together. The head of one another veterans charity who also requested anonymity to avoid being targeted by Wounded Warrior Project said, 
We're not going to spend a dime or a moment confronting the bully in the neighborhood. We're going to focus on the actual wounded warriors. Now we're gonna continue on to Graham's vindication because as it turns out, maybe the Wounded Warrior Project growing so fast and getting all this attention really wasn't good for them. Because in 2016, the press shined a light on an aspect of their charity I'm sure we all knew I would take a look at eventually, their spending. It's fair to say that CEOs of charities deserve a living wage, absolutely. And I'm not suggesting that everyone who works for a charity should be a volunteer, especially if they're doing it full time. That would be extremely unrealistic. However, lavish spending from a charity is something else. The New York Times did an incredible length deep dive into this in 2016. And if you wanna see their full report, of course, it will be linked in my sources because I do not have the time to read this entire article to you we would literally be here for way too long. But let's go over some of the key bullet points here. Now for some context here, and if you didn't know, one of the things the Wounded Warrior Project does is hand out backpacks. Wounded Warrior Project backpacks delivered bedside to wounded warriors is a message that they're known for. Wounded Warrior backpacks contain essential care and comfort items, including clothing, toiletries, calling cards, and playing cards, all designed to make their hospital stay more comfortable. They are provided to severely wounded service members arriving at military trauma centers. A smaller version of the WWP backpack transitional care packs are sent directly to Iraq and Afghanistan to provide immediate comfort during a warrior's relocation to a US military trauma center. Dave Phillips explains that since they've evolved from a basement operation handing out backpacks, they turned into a fundraising giant, which in 2015 took in more than $372 million and many of these are from small donations from the elderly. Today, the charity has 22 locations offering programs to help veterans readjust to society, attend school, find work, and participate in athletics. It contributes millions to smaller veteran groups, and it has become a brand name, its logo emblazoned on sneakers, paper towel packs, and television commercials that run dozens of times. But in its swift rise, it has also embraced aggressive styles of fundraising, marketing, and personnel management that have many current and former employees questioning whether it has drifted from its mission. It has spent millions of dollars a year on travel, dinners, hotels, and conferences that often seemed more lavish than appropriate. More than four dozen current and former employees said in interviews. Former workers recounted buying business class seats and regularly jetting around the country for minor meetings or staying in $500 a night hotel rooms. The organization has also spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in recent years on public relations and lobbying campaigns to deflect criticism of its spending and to fight legislative efforts to restrict how much nonprofits spend on overhead. About 40% of the organization's donations in 2014 were spent on its overhead, or about $124 million, according to the charity rating group, Charity Navigator. While that percentage, which includes administrative expenses and marketing costs, is not as much as some four groups, it is far more than many veterans charities, including the Semper Fi Fund, a wounded veterans group that spent about 8% of donations on overhead. As a result, some philanthropic washdog groups have criticized the Wounded Warrior Project for spending too heavily on itself. Some of its own employees have criticized it too. William Chick, a former supervisor, spent five years with the Wounded Warrior Project. It slowly had less focus on veterans and more on raising money and protecting the organization, he said. And listen, after looking at Kids Wish Network, I don't think I'm ever gonna find a charity with a worse standard. Like I don't think the bar can be set any low than the Kids Wish Network, but this one's pretty bad too. The Wounded Warrior Project is pretty transparent with their numbers, though that doesn't make the numbers good just because they're readily available and they're not a scam either. They are within IRS regulations, but even those sources say that they admit that the numbers are just not great. Plus, I think the percentages are important to recognize here. 25% to fundraising doesn't sound bad. It sounds like a fair number. But if a company makes $372 million in a year and 25% of that is spent, that's $93 million. Why? Are those what television commercials cost now? The billboards? 
because reading this New York Times article, it sure seems that fundraising could have just been lavish parties too. And what's worse and what really gets me mad here are their executives. Listen to what Nardizzi had to say. In an interview at the organization's four-story headquarters in a palm-lined office park in Jacksonville, Florida, Mr. Nardizzi, 45, said spending on fundraising and other expenses not directly related to veterans programs has enabled the Wounded Warrior Project to grow faster and serve more people. It estimates that 80,000 veterans have used its services. I look at companies like Starbucks, that's the model, Mr. Nardizzi said. If you're looking at companies that are getting it right, treating their employees right, delivering great services and great products, then are growing the brand to support all of that. Now, here's the thing, Starbucks is a for-profit model. This massive cafe chain is their fucking model for a non-profit. And do you guys not see where that is, you know, maybe slightly not okay? I mean, hell, the year before this article came out, a 2015 nationwide survey of Starbucks employees showed that the company is not living up to its commitment to provide predictable, sustainable schedules to its workforce. Starbucks' frontline employees bear the brunt of the management imperative to minimize store labor costs, which takes precedence over attempts to stabilize work hours, provide healthy schedules, and to ensure employees have real input into their working conditions. So again, them saying, let's use Starbucks as an example of how our non-prof for veterans should work. Like, is it any wonder then that his salary was nearing half a million dollars in 2014? He even argued with the charity councils when they called him out on frivolous spending. Here's what he had to say. People could spend money on the most ridiculous thing and no one batted an eye, said Connie Chapman, who was in charge of the charity's Seattle office for two years. I would fly to New York for less than a day to report to my supervisor. All staff members flying to the charity's office at a military hospital in Germany traveled in business class, employees said. One current employee said her last minute ticket cost $7,000. Mr. Nardizzi fired Ms. Chapman, an Iraq veteran with PTSD in 2012 as part of a management restructuring, she said. By 2014, the group was spending $7.5 million per year on travel, according to tax forms. The Wounded Warrior Project asserts that it spent 80% of donations on programs, but former employees and charity watchdogs say the charity inflates its number by using practices such as counting some marketing materials as educational. The spending began to attract attention. Charity Watch, an independent monitoring group, gave Wounded Warrior Project a D rating in 2011 and has not given it a grade higher than a C since. Mr. Nardizzi fought back. In 2013, according to tax forms, the Wounded Warrior Project gave $150,000 to a nonprofit called the Charity Defense Council and Mr. Nardizzi joined its advisory board. The council's mission includes defending charity spending on overhead and executive salaries, its website says. So looking at all these numbers and accusations, it's not hard to wonder where it all went wrong. I want to step aside for a moment to address that as well, because it's not as if a veteran wanting to help others got an ego or became greedy here. It's actually quite the opposite. If you ask me, I think one of the reasons this charity went south is because it wasn't Mr. Malia's charity anymore. Remember from the beginning, the Marine veteran who started all of this? Yeah, he hasn't been involved with almost any of it. Remember how I said for the first decade, the Wounded Warrior Project had almost zero controversy? Well, that's because Mr. Malia left in 2009, a few years before all these controversies began. As the Backpack Project grew, Mr. Malia hired a few employees, including Mr. Nardizzi, a lawyer who had never served in the military, but was an executive for a small nonprofit, the United Spinal Association, which served disabled veterans. They began raising millions of dollars and broadening their services to include adaptive sports for disabled veterans, employment and benefits help, and retreats to teach veterans to cope with post-traumatic stress disorder. By 2009, the group had grown to almost 50 employees and $21 million in revenue. But by then, Mr. Malia and Mr. Nardizzi were fighting over the charity's future, with Mr. Nardizzi pushing for more aggressive expansion than Mr. Malia, former employees said. By January 2009, Mr. Malia had resigned. Mr. Nardizzi had said in an interview that Mr. Malia left to pursue business ventures, but Mr. Malia's ex-wife, Julie Malia, who worked at the charity at the time, said in an interview that her former husband felt like the organization was stolen from him. He didn't want to leave, but it was obvious something was going to happen, Miss Malia said. 
The organization paid Mr. Malia at least $230,000 after he stepped down, according to tax forms. He has never spoken publicly about his disagreements with Mr. Nardizzi and declined to be interviewed. And honestly, if Mr. Molina had fired Nardizzi, things might have been different here, but that may also have not been a possibility. It doesn't sound like it was, to be honest. Nardizzi was a lawyer, not a veteran. And I'm not saying lawyers and businessmen can't run charities and do it right, but the point is, is that this was Mr. Malia's passion. He knew what it was like to be an injured veteran that needed help, and he wanted to create outreach for these people, like him. One veteran, Mr. Millette, even said that Wounded Warrior Project just took me to a Red Sox game and on a weekend retreat. But the charity wanted him to say they helped him recover from PTSD and traumatic brain injury. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like a weekend retreat doesn't cure PTSD. The Wounded Warrior Project didn't just lose its way or forget what it was about. It lost the person who made it what it was in the first place. They lost the compassion and care of Malia, making backpacks in his basement to try and help people. They compare themselves to Starbucks and push a brand on people. And are they a complete and utter scam? No, but they're not a company I want to support either. And yes, I'm saying company right now because honestly, I'm finding it increasingly difficult to see this place as a charity. Now, unfortunately, it still gets a lot worse from here. Part of the organization's drive for growth has been a tough stance toward workers considered unproductive or disloyal. After Jesse Longoria recovered from a roadside bomb blast that nearly killed him in Iraq, he got a job with the organization training veterans to help other veterans. I loved it, the former Marine sniper said. By giving back, I was helping myself and helping other vets. In 2012, he had been working for the charity for about a year, and he had to have his right arm amputated because of lingering damage from Iraq. Soon after the amputation, he said, he was racked by haunting emotions from Iraq and checked himself into suicide watch at a psychiatric ward. A week later, he was back at work when a fist fight broke out between veteran mentors who had been drinking after one of his training sessions. He was not in the room at the time, but was held responsible for the fight. His boss at the time, Mr. Chick said in an interview. Mr. Chick's own supervisor told him to fire Mr. Longoria. Mr. Chick said he refused, but was ordered by his boss to write an email recommending the firing. He said, you better do this or you are going to look disloyal to the organization, Mr. Chick said. It was a very coercive conversation. The Wounded Warrior Project said Mr. Longoria was terminated at Mr. Chick's recommendation. The organization fired Mr. Chick later the same day for insubordination. Mr. Longoria said he was offered money in exchange for signing a non-disclosure agreement, but refused. Other former employees said they had signed such forms and could not speak. Mr. Longoria said after he was fired, he fell into depression, but was also relieved. He said he felt guilty about what he saw as widespread waste. Once a child came by the office to donate a piggy bank. Another time, a woman called to donate part of her son's life insurance after he was killed in Afghanistan, he said. It got under my skin, started eating at me, he said. I knew where my money was going to. It seemed to me like it was a big lie. Some sources like the BBB have cleared the WWP of lavish spending now that it's been some time. But even if they've improved on that, what's their excuse for how they've treated employees? Maybe they really are trying to be like Starbucks after all. I don't know. Going out for fancy dinners isn't team building. Maybe if Wounded Warrior Project had done some actual real team building, they wouldn't have found themselves in this mess in the first place. Some former employees have even explained that they've felt used by the Wounded Warrior Project, not helped. You're using our injuries, our darkest days, our hardships to make money. So you can have these big parties, Army Staff Sergeant Eric, a former Wounded Warrior Project public speaker told CBS News. Blog posts online from disabled veterans like Brian Black say they can no longer support WWP because of their lawsuit happy attitude and because of their attitude towards the second amendment. And I'm not gonna get into that area too deep because I just wanna go over the facts of the company and not people's opinions on gun rights. This is not the video for that. And look, I want the organization to change and do better. To some extent, it seems like they are starting to clean up their act a little bit since the most recent article I found and have seen about them is that their $7.25 million donation is going towards caregivers of veterans. So that's a new thing, which sounds pretty good. Maybe with their board truly taking some time for self-reflection, they'll do better in the future. But for now, it's not something I entirely trust. It's something that we're gonna have to see as time goes on. 
And just as a little last minute kind of thing is Steven Nardizzi. He's gone. He's not part of the organization anymore either. Now, they still do have a lot of work to do and there's a lot of trust left to rebuild. Hopefully they can though and become an actually good nonprofit instead of some weird Starbucks-esque nonprofit brand shenanigans. But with that being said, that's where I'm going to end today's video. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. It does seem a little too soon to say that they've changed for good, but here's to hoping that potentially a couple years down the line, we can actually see the full effect of this. If you like this video or learn something new in it, make sure to hit that subscribe button, like the video if you did, and if you want more information or connecting with me on other places, links for everything will be down below, including the sources I used, all my social media, second channels and projects, blah, 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 blah. Everything will be down below. So thank you guys so much for making it to another video. Love you guys, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.